Thank you, Pastor Howling. Invite your attention to the book of Job, chapter 3, if you would, please. Job, chapter 3. I want to thank First Baptist Church for the summer preaching conference. I have made every one so far. There is not, I don't understand, I don't think yet there is a, uh, a perfect attendance award for the summer preaching conference, but I want one, okay? I, I will not miss one. Pastor House says, I've missed two of them. Well, shame on you. I'm with my perfect attendance award. But in all honesty, I'll tell you as a pastor, I love coming up here on Tuesdays. I look forward to it. It's a long enough drive where I kind of enjoy it, you know, it's quiet. The kids don't go with me. And uh, it, it, I tell you, it, I, I want to be fed. And the speaker's coming in. And when I first got my letter in the mail of everybody coming in, I said, Pastor, how, how dare you? You owe me gas money. I can't miss any of these. They're all good. And so I really appreciate that. Thank you, Pastor Howell. Pastor Howe has been a great friend of mine. He has been a support to me. I love him and his family, and uh, they are just so great to me. And, uh, well, let me tell you, I'm, I'm Pastor Todd. I'm not Dr. Jones. I hope, he, uh, hope he's doing much better. I hope he's feeling very good. I'd be willing to risk COVID just to hear him. But, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, the Lord had different plans. And uh, I'm Pastor Todd. I, I pastor a church called Oxbow Lake Baptist Church. Anyone know where Oxbow Lake Baptist Church is? few of you. Okay, I'm going to let you know. Oxbow Lake Baptist Church is in the city of White Lake. Does that make more sense? Do anyone know where White Lake is? Okay. We're Oxbow Lake Baptist Church. We're in White Lake, and we exist on Elizabeth Lake Road. Does that help? And the worst part about it is I'm the pastor, and I don't even know how to swim. So pray for me. Pray for me. I have my family with me today. Uh, well, I did have my wife and daughter. I have, I have a wonderful wife. I've been married for 15 years. She is my sweetheart. I love her. The honeymoon ain't over yet. i got twin boys. They're six years old, Lincoln and Levi. They're starting school here in the fall. We're very excited about that. And the Lord has blessed us with a five-month-old daughter. And, uh, oh, boy, I'll tell you what. One daughter is harder to raise than two boys I've learned so far. At least that's my experience. But we, what a blessing it is. We, we found out we were expecting, and it kind of was a little bit of a surprise. And I ain't getting any younger. And uh, we went to break it to the boys that, you know, we're going to have a daughter. And we said, Lincoln, Levi, i got to tell you something. I said, Mommy and Daddy are expecting a baby. And Lincoln, the, the oldest of the twins by seven minutes, he says, Well, I know. I asked God for a little sister. And I said, well, son, um, it might be a little boy, it might be a little girl, I don't know. There's been no girls in my family since before World War II, you know. So I, I said, well, it's probably going to be another little boy. He goes, no, I asked God. And so we found out, we, we opened the envelope together, you know, from the ultrasound. We said, oh, we're having, and Lincoln says, yeah, I know, I prayed God for a little. Lincoln, please do not pray for any more siblings. <laughs> I. He, Lincoln's in the back. Lincoln, if you want to raise your hand, give Lincoln your prayer request. Lincoln, raise your hand up real high. See him in the back. He's back right Six years old, he, give him your prayer request. Well, let me get started. I will never get to an end here. We're in Job chapter 3. And in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, it's a little bit of recap to kind of get us some running speed because Job chapter 3 kind of stands in this transitional kind of chapter in the middle of this wonderful book. And Job has been devastated by calamity one after another. I mean, I talk about having a bad day. We complain about the year 2020. This guy had a bad day. Job, in one day, he lost all of his family. His children, I mean, how devastating that is. In fact, one day he lost his possessions. He was a, a man of great wealth. He had everything. And he just goes down to nothing. He, he keeps his, his testimony. And after a while, he loses his, his health. He has a just, if you read the, the, the text here, it tells us he has boils from the sole of his feet to the top of his head. He's in real bad shape. He, he loses the support of his wife. His wife says, you know what you need to do, Job? Curse God and, and die. Curse job and curse God and go kill yourself. He, he lost the support of his wife, and, and but he's just in a bad situation. And here we are, we're presented with one of one, one, one of our Christians' uh, toughest questions that we have to answer. It comes up, and if it's not one of the toughest, it's one of the most common questions we get as Christians. We have it at one time or another. Every pastor has been asked this a million different times in a million different forms. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the righteous have to suffer? I mean, it, it's a great question, and a lot of people think, well, that's the whole point of Job. That's the, listen, my friends, that is not the theme of Job. If that were the theme of Job, Job would be over in a chapter and a half, okay? There's a lot more left there. It's a great part of it as we're working ourselves up to it. But we ask ourselves that question. It's a generic way in many ways. Basically, when we say, why do the righteous have to suffer? We're saying, why do I have to go through things that are uncomfortable? 
Why do people I love have to suffer? God, why is it sometimes things aren't fair? And we ask that one way or another. It's an okay question, I guess. I'm going to tell you, it's a hard question to answer when you're in Job's situation. When, when your world's closing in on you, then you kind of, kind of figure out what's going on and why. It was back in May, first Friday in May 2009. I was a youth pastor. I've been on full-time staff for about five years. And, you know, youth pastors are not exactly known for having great ideas. I said, I, I had this whole group of teenagers, or gra- a big group of teenagers graduating to college. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? We're going we're to do this big, you know, this, this big transition, this big jump in life from going from high school to college. We're going to go skydiving. Yay! You know, and of course, they're like, yay! And I'm a youth pastor, and I don't know any better. Yay! And, and I'd done it before. I, I, no matter what I'm about to tell you in the next few minutes, I still recommend everybody go skydiving at least once, okay? Um, for any reason, if you've done it, just, it's just something you just, you've got. You, when you do it, you'll understand. Okay, uh, if you don't, Pastor Howe will pay the money back. Okay, so it, it, it's a really wonderful thing. And so I, I took them, and I, I've gone before, and so I was kind of like, okay, I've done this. I had kind of the efficacy in my mind, like, okay, this isn't that scary. The door opened, and I flung myself out, and we, you know, we're all just flying down. It's fantastic. Ground's coming, and right about four thousand feet, you pull the rip cord somewhere around there, and I remember the chute can open up, and you can. Okay, and now you're, now you're, I mean, it's a really kind of a violent thing, and, and in that moment, when the chute opened up. Man, I knew something was wrong. I, I could not hear out of my left ear. It was really weird. But I was also hanging 4,000 feet above the earth, so that wasn't my biggest priority at the moment, you know? We land, and I'm telling you, I, something else happened. When we landed, I'll never forget this. Now, listen, I, I'm, a, I'm a good Baptist little boy, okay? I never drank, never smoked. The ground is going like this. And I've never seen the ground do this before. And I'm going, I'm standing there going like, whoa, you know, like, what is going on here? I couldn't hear. The ground was moving real funny. I thought, man, something's, something's kind of wrong. And I think, I think after a while, I kind of just got my, my equilibrium a little bit back and I thought I was okay. And I drove, I drove, I drove the kids back and the church man, you know. And I remember going to the doctor, and I said, man, I said, something, it just feels like I'm in my car keys, like digging out, like something's not right in there. And the doctor says, you know what this is? This is eustachian tube dysfunction. You can have sinus pressure. And sometimes that tube will collapse in on itself. Don't worry about it. It'll clear up on its own. And I said, are you sure? And I said, the worst part about it really to me was this. What I lacked in hearing, I gained in this loud screeching in my left ear. It was this 24-7 constant. Sometimes it'll change pitches. Sometimes it'll go ping, 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 ping. I have no idea what that is. It does that sometimes. And so I said, oh, okay. A few days later, I went back to the doctor. I said, can I go see a specialist? I'm just really concerned about something just doesn't seem right to me. And I went back in the doctor, and they can actually test your hearing without even, um, you don't have to do like through your ear test. They can actually put a little thing on the, on the bone right behind your ear, and it bypasses the eustachian tube, goes right in there. And uh, so we got all done with it. I, you know, it's hit the button, here's beep. You hit the button, beep, hit the button. I thought, I thought I aced it. I mean, everyone I heard, I hit the button on, right? I mean, I thought it did pretty good. And we get all done, and I look in the lady, and I said, well, what's going on? She kind of snickers at me a little bit. She goes, wow, you have significant hearing loss in your left ear. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm here for. Fix it. <laughs> and she says, um, no, you don't understand. She says, your nerve is dead in there. It's dead. And uh, so it took me a little while to figure out what this was all about. And somehow this has never happened in the history of the universe before. Um, the pressure change, falling that far, the balance mechanism in my ear exploded. And when that liquid that you use for balance, when it touches the nerve, it kills it on contact. Um, a lot of this I've kind of learned on my own. And, and what's interesting is if you've ever seen the human brain, like a diagram of a human brain, it's got like frontal lobe, it's these little sections and all. The brain's not like that. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. It's, it's all interconnected. And your hearing is really interwoven with your emotions. 
Like, that's kind of why, we, why, why my music, like, we had some beautiful music. Wasn't that fantastic? Gets us in the right spirit for worship, you know, kind of the same thing. And what happens if you experience significant hearing loss, more often than not, you're going to experience some depression and anxiety behind it. I didn't know that. They put me on steroids. And again, steroids to me, they just make me so depressed. And, and I, so I had this, this feeling of impending doom, and I needed something to latch on to. So I latched on to, I'm never going to hear silence again. My, my ear doesn't work. This loud screeching is going to drive me crazy. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up in, in, in the psychiatric ward and, and, and what am I going to tell my wife and what am I going to tell my church and, and listen, what I'm going to tell you next I'm not proud of but I want to be transparent with you I walked out of the doctor's office I didn't call my wife I didn't talk to anybody yet and I, I opened the door and there was this parking lot and behind the parking lot there was a field and I looked at that field and I'm not proud of this, okay? For half a second, this thought popped in my mind. You don't have to live with this. You can go out there and you can end it right now. You can just be done. How much of that was just the depression behind it and the shock of everything and realizing the screeching's never going to go away and the hopelessness. And I, For half a second. And then immediately, everything kicked back in. No, 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 you, no, no, no. Jesus is enough. And, and you have a wonderful wife. And what would they do? And that would be terrible. What a terrible example. And, and all those things. But, oh boy, it was kind of tempting for half a second. Now, I, I want to tell you this because I look over a congregation of good independent fundamental Baptists here. And I'm sure none of you have even jaywalked before. You, you look like really honest people. I would trust you with my children. And, and I'm sure no one here has ever gone through anything or is going through anything and actually thought in the deep recesses of their mind, way back in a dark place, never to utter it out loud. You know what? If I were to do it, I would do it like that. If we're not careful, we can arrive at the wrong answer. This is where we find Job in chapter 3. In fact, Job, his, his three friends, his friends come to, to help him. And the interesting thing is, really they're coming to help themselves. If you read on with his friends, his friends are actually kind of scared because Job's a good guy. Everybody knows Job's a good guy. How could this happen? Their sense of justice and, and a lot of Job's friends are looking at him going, if it can happen to him, this could happen to me. And so they have to, they go through this, this persecution. They, they, they say, Job, you had to have messed up. They're trying to balance the equation for God. There has to be some sin equal to what happened in your life. They have no idea what's going on. They're trying. They come, they sit in the ground for seven days with them and seven nights. They sit in silence. And in fact, you look at the customs, it's, it's kind of like a funeral. Like they're mourning his life while he's still alive. He's, he's so pathetic. He's sitting on the ashes. He, he's not the Job they remember. And then after some time, Job opens up his heart and he talks to them. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so he, he opens and he arrives at the very wrong, very wrong answer for human suffering. In fact, Job comes to the conclusion, well, the answer to suffering is not living. He, Job, first, I want you to see, he has a very flawed view of life here in Job chapter 3. Let me go through the, the first 12 verses here. I'll try not to make too much application here, but you'll see the, the, the illusion or the, the symbolism of light and dark. Light is life, and, and dark is not so much death, but it's just, it's just, it's just nothingness. It's a race. It's, it's gone. And in, in, in chapter 1, he says, After this opened Job his mouth, and, and he cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish when I was born. In the night when I was saved, or said, there is a man child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the sun shine upon it. Let the darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined unto the days of the year. Let it not come to the number of the months. Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come from therein. Let them curse it that curse the day, who are ready to raise up their, their morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. And let it look for light and have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day, because it shut not out the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid the sorrow from mine eyes. Why did I not, why died I not from my, from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Why did not the knees prevent me, or why the breast that I should suck? For 
Now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept and I had been at rest. You see, Job, is he sat down for quite some time here and he's been thinking about his suffering and thinking about his suffering and he's kind of come to this conclusion that life is the conduit for suffering. If you don't want to suffer, don't live. This is where his twisted mind has, has, has brought him here. In fact, we see he says one thing four different ways. Early on, he, he says in verse 3 through 10, he says, he's, I wish I was never conceived. I wish that I, I was never conceived. We get to verse 11. And he says, well, if I was conceived, then, then, then I wish I would have been miscarried. And in the second half of, of verse 11, he says, well, if I could have been miscarried, I wish I would have died in, at birth. And in verse 12, he says, if I would have survived birth, I wish I would have died in infancy. Job has concluded that the answer to suffering is not to live. It's the only logical escape from pain and suffering. And Job wishes he just didn't exist. You know, this attitude never solves any problems, by the way. He really wasted a lot of, a lot of time there. In fact, you know, my children are, are kind of like this sometimes. They're a little dramatic. I don't know when they're like five, four or five years old, they're really dramatic. You know, I'll take them out. We can have the best day a five-year-old can ever have. We can go out to Chuck E. Cheese, you know, back when that was actually, you could go to, by the way, now that after, during the pandemic, I look back and go, I can't believe we went to Chuck E. Cheese. I mean, that place is festering with flu and, you know, ball pits and all this stuff. So we go Chuck E. Cheese, man. They love, they love Chuck E. Cheese. It's dumb. The pizza's terrible and all this stuff. They love Chuck E. Cheese. We can do that. On the way home, we can stop and get slushies, man. My kids love slushies. We get slushies. I can give them the best day ever. And I'm saying, all right, guys, we have just had the best day ever. It's time to go to bed. Let me kiss you. Good bed. I'm telling you, one of them bumps their head on the bed rail or something like that. <laughs> it's the worst day ever. I say, it's okay, son. You're only five years old. It's the worst day so far. <laughs> like, like you guys have never even had a deacons meeting yet. Like you don't even know how bad it can get. I just kidding. I love my deacons. Most of them. My kids will say it a lot. It, 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 you know, I tell you, it bothered me. The Bible says that this is the day which the Lord hath made. And I, we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. And I'm going to tell you what, we are in dangerous ground when we curse a blessing from God. Life is a blessing. Job's argument's pointless. Not like you, you can't go back and not be born. There's no time machine. He's, he has a flawed view of life, but he also has a flawed view of death also. Look at verses 13 through 19. He, again, he says, for, for now I should have lain still and been quiet. I have slept and, and been at rest. I mean, look at how he sees death. With, with kings and counselors of the earth who built desolate places for themselves, or with princes that had gold who had filled their houses with silver, or as a hidden untimely birth I had not been as infants which never saw light. There the wicked cease from trembling, troubling, and they shall... And there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Job sees death as somehow this, this, this godless rest. And I think a lot of people see it that way. If you to ask people what they think death is, I think a lot of people think that it's, it's just some kind of this, it's this, 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 at least if anything, it's peace. It's nothingness. It, it, it's, it's going into oblivion. We even see, we drive down the road, we see little crosses next to the road, and they say, R, I, P on them. Rest in peace. Now, I've read the Bible. I, I, I mean, I think there is rest in heaven. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's the first thing we think of when we get there, right? Like, when I get to heaven, I'm like, hey, Jesus, how are you, man? Thanks for saving me. You're the best. I love you so much. I want to praise you forever and ever and ever. And then I'm going to turn over here. And I'm going to see, like, King David. Like, King David! And, like, tell me why you killed him. And I'll see grandpa and grandma. And I'll see church members have gone. And we'll be praising Jesus. And it'll be this wonderful thing. I'll walk the streets of gold, do a couple backflips. I guess, if I could. I don't know. I mean, I just don't think the first thing, we get to heaven and we're like, where's my bed? <laughs> I'm ready to go take a nap. Is that cloud from, from me? Is that, you know? But it, 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 Job just sees us like, man, I'm just, I need, I need to take a nap. You know, I just, I just want to be done with, with all of this. And I mean, for, we can understand in the grand scheme of things, we're live for three score, three score and ten by strength. We're, we're, we, we get some time here, but I mean, eternity compared to our time here is like, huh and hmm. You know what I mean? 
I mean, this is just the beginning. And praise God, He doesn't leave us ignorant to know what happens when we die. If you've trusted Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, absent the body is present with the Lord. So we know streets of gold, mansions, grand reunion, no more sickness, no more death, no more COVID, no more suffering, no more separation. It sounds wonderful. And Jesus earned it for us. But you know, what about those who don't know Jesus? When suffering comes into their life, what about that little voice on their shoulder? You know, it's like called the little voice. We'll just call it that. We'll call it the enemy. We'll call it that, 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 that sin nature. We'll call that, that we'll call it the devil whispering in their ear and saying, you know what? End it. Rest. Can you imagine for that poor soul who's planning on rest, goes and takes their own life and ends up in torment? Let me tell you something about the devil before we move on here. He's a liar. Okay? That's what Jesus said. Okay? I'm just... I'm just I'm, Jesus says he's a liar. Every time he speaks, he lies. When I was reading through Job, I, I went through every time the devil spoke, I said, where's his lie at? Because that's all he does. He, the thief comes out to steal, kill, and destroy. He is a liar. He's a liar from the beginning. And all he does is lie. And you can just imagine somebody in suffering going, yep, 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 do it. Do it. Do it. It'll all end. It'll all be better. And can you imagine the torment? Well, Job has his, his flawed view of life. He has a flawed view of, of death. And so, I mean, he, he arrives at a flawed conclusion. We get down to verse 20. Wherefore is light given to him that is in misery or life? And, and life unto and the bitter soul. He says, which long for death, but it cometh not. And, and dig for it more than hid treasures, which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hid? whom God has hedged in. For my sign cometh before I eat, my roarings are poured out like the waters. And here's Job to say, man, he's like, God, like, he's hedged me in. I, I can't do anything, but I just want to, I just want to cease to exist, and, and, and God won't let me. Well, doesn't he know the best is still yet to come? God's working on something. But his mind right now, if we could get Job aside right here at this chapter, this verse, Job would say, listen, I, I figured it out. I've thought about it. Death is the answer. It is the only way out of suffering. And he says, why can't I die? Unfortunately, Satan gets a lot of people to this conclusion. The pain and suffering get to be so big they can't see hope anymore. They don't think clearly. They don't look down the road. They don't realize this too shall pass. They just want the pain to stop. In fact, I was doing a little research on this. I, I work with our, our police department in our, in our area. And uh, Pastor House, I, I like to run. I run the parks a lot. I like to run the woods. And little, I, I always thought if somebody killed himself in the woods or something, I always thought like that would be all over the news, 247. I mean, it would be all over. And, and come to find out, it's a very common thing. Nobody reports on it. In fact, in the last two decades, suicides in Michigan are up a third. How many of you are ages 15 to 44? How many of you? 15 to 44, most of us here? Yeah, I wish I was closer to the 15, right? Well, you know, for us, statistically, you know what our, 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 our most likely chance of dying or a cause of death is? It's ourself, whether through accident or at our own hands. It happens all around our community. I found out about a, just recently there was a, a man who, who they can tell by the receipts that were left in his pocket. He, he, he walked almost right by our church. He went and got his final meal at the Kroger right by our church, went to the woods across the street, and, and there he hung for six months for nobody even noticed he was gone. I gotta tell you, my community, that kills me. If you're a pastor here today, I'm gonna give you some great counsel. I don't remember where I, even, I got it from. I was listening to another pastor preach. He says, if you preach in a city, when you walk about that city, in your mind, you are the pastor of that whole city. Take responsibility for them. Take responsibility for the souls there. And I can tell you, it broke me that somebody could do that and be, and be gone for six months and nobody even knew about it. And he would have walked right past our church if we just could have been there, if we just could have talked to him. How different it could have happened. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the name Jack Kevorkian. It's been a little bit of time ago, but uh, he really left an impact in Oakland County. We're just south of you all there. Anytime there is a hospice death, the police have to go and investigate. It's the only place in the country where they have to do that because he was a doctor. I use that term lo loosely. He was a doctor that somebody wanted to end their life. Well, he'd help you do it peacefully and, and nicely if you had some kind of terminal illness. And you may say, well, what's wrong with that? People want to go out in their own terms. There's something very wrong with that. God is the author and finisher of death or life. God determines the beginning. And I'm going to tell you what, God also is the definer of life. 
had a, somebody promoting abortion. They told me one time, they said, it's just a lump of cells. Well, I'm just a lump of cells. You can kill me too. I mean, good night, you know. How bold would you have to be to say, I'm going to define when life begins. Come on now. God designed it. God defines it. But life is a blessing. And I'm saying, if we curse a blessing, what we are doing is questioning the goodness of God. And that was what Satan wanted to when he was talking in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Basically, Satan's premise was, yeah, Job likes you because you protect him and you give. I mean, look at the guy. He's filthy rich. I mean, he, he's, he's well taken care of. And basically, what Satan's saying is, you know, Job won't love you if you pull back your blessings from him, your protection from him. I'll even break that down a little bit further. Remember, he's a liar. What he's saying is, God, you are not worthy of love. You have to buy it. That's what he's saying. Did I mention he's a liar? Okay, I just want to make sure. That's exactly what the, the enemy wants. For us to question the goodness of God. Didn't that what he tried to do to Eve early in the garden in Genesis chapter 3? Yea, God said, you shall be as gods. Just, just obey him. God is holding back on you. There's goodness here. You just got to disobey God. Now, before I go any further, let me say there's nothing here to indicate that Job was even contemplating killing himself. I believe a child of God in their right mind would not harm themselves purposely. But sometimes, 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 we Christians, we get ourselves in a Job-type mindset. Maybe we have a really bad day and we say, man, I just wish that rapture would happen today. And by the way, it's good to look forward to seeing Jesus come. I'm looking forward to that. But we can be in a bad way and we say, get me out of my skin quick. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Where did Job go wrong? In chapter 1 and chapter 2, he's like, hey, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He goes to his wife, his wife says, curse God and die. He says, you speak as a foolish woman. Job, in, in, in 1 and 2, he, he's doing really well, and all of a sudden this wrong theology creeps in. And like I said, Satan will use suffering to slip in wrong doctrine. You ever have a dog that won't like take medicine, right? You got you what you got to do? You got to... Yeah, put it in something, you know, a little, you know, a little different. You know, put it in some cheese, put it in some, some bologna, right? You know, just put it in there. And sometimes Satan will do that because, well, you know, listen, they go to a good church. They know the Bible. They know everything that's right. I, I, I can't get in there right now, but if I can maybe soften the palate a little bit, if I can give them some suffering, if I can kind of just shake the, the core just a little bit, maybe, just maybe, they'll be more susceptible to my lies. I'm not proud to say for a shorter period of time, I took a much worldly -er path to relief. I trusted in the wrong things. Um, all my self-sufficiency came up short. I, 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 I realized when it came down to it, I said, okay, now I have this thing I'm going to live with now. I'm going to have this, this, this loud screeching. I'm really struggling with anxiety sometimes. I'm, I'm really struggling with some depressive thoughts at times. I, 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 here's what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. I am going to absorb it. I am going to outpower it. I am going to outrun this thing. Pastor, I'll mention, I, I, like to, I like to be tough. I like to, I want to, you know, marathon's cool. That's all right. I mean, if you run marathons, that's cute, you know. But, uh, you know, a real man's going to be out there for 50 miles or 100 miles. And I thought, well, if I can run 100 miles, surely I can, I can out-tough this thing. Because 100 miles is not about agility. It's not about, you know, what kind of shape you're in. It's, just, it's about being bored for a long period of time. And a lot of blisters on your feet. That's, that's what running 100 miles is all about. I said, I can do this. I know I can do this. And, you know, I couldn't. It got bad. It got bad to the point where I started having these atypical visual migraines. What that is, is all of a sudden there'll be some fuzzies out of one corner of my eye, and all of a sudden they'll go across my eyes, and I'm, I'm essentially blind for about five to ten minutes or so. Now listen, I already lost hearing, all right? You know, like this ear is only good for holding up sunglasses now, you know what I mean? And so, like, like, don't take away my vision, too. I, I, go, to, I go to the doctor, I'm like, man, this thing's, she says, you're having atypical visual migraines. Okay, fantastic. Like, now what? She says, well, I'll tell you what. I can, I can, I can help you with that. I can prescribe something for you. And for, for the time leading up to this, my doctor and I have always had a conversation. She goes, you're, you need, you need antidepressants. And listen, I, I'm not saying what, you, if you're on anything right now, that's between you, the doctor, and, and, and the Lord, okay? Don't do anything based, I'm not a doctor, okay? But I always didn't want that. I didn't want that. I said, no, 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 I, I don't, I need, a, I need Jesus. I don't need a pill. I, I can do this. I can do this. And, and, and so she says, I, I'm going to prescribe to you, um, this low, 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 uh, dose of, of Zoloft. And it, it, I said, well, make the, the, the migraines, the vision thing, go away? He says, yes, it will. Now, let me tell you something. 
is someone who is wound up tight, tighter than a drum, someone who is very anxious, who always thinks the worst situation is going to come out of everything, and then all of a sudden, I am numb. I mean, buddy, I, I, I never felt so good in my life. My wife loved it. She thought I was just, you want to go shopping, hon? Here's my credit cards. Like, I just, nothing riled me up at all. Nothing riled me up one bit. I was the calmest dude that ever existed, but I knew. I started thinking, I go, this is kind of weird. I don't care. I'm a youth pastor. I had a wonderful youth ministry. I had about 50 kids in my youth ministry. I saw lots of souls saved, and I thought, this is, I'm not proud of this, okay? I said to myself, self, you've been doing this for a long time. You can fake your way through ministry. You've done this long enough. You don't need a heart. You just need a brain, okay? Like the scarecrow or the tin man. I don't remember which one. But, you know, you can do this. You can get through this. And, and, and I'll never forget, I was getting ready to go leave on vacation, and one of the young men, probably about 16, 17 years old, after I got done teaching on Wednesday night, he came, he sat down in my office. He was really upset. And if you're a youth pastor, this is a common thing. It happens all the time. He goes and he sits down in my office. And I said, what's up, buddy? What's going on? He goes, hey, pastor, i got to talk to you. And he was real agitated. What's up? Um... We need you here. Here I am. What do you want? No, no, no. He goes, something's wrong with you. We need you here. I guess I wasn't faking it too well. We went on vacation. We went up to uh, Mackinac. Mackinac has a dark sky conservatory. My wife thought it'd be kind of cool to go there, and there was be an asteroid shower that night. So that was fascinating. <laughs> and you always miss it. Everybody goes, oh, and you go, what? Where did it go? Because you're basically just like this for like hours, you know. And I'll never forget it. We're there. I don't know why we're there. And there was like this, there was this uh, volunteer and they had some, uh, some uh, telescope set up and they're looking at Saturn. And it was, I guess it was kind of cool, you know. And there's this girl and she's, she's now, she's like a volunteer and she's just telling people kind of like real casually, but she's collecting a crowd and she's telling people about the, the, uh, all the different uh, constellations. This is Ursa Minor. It is a bear who wrestled an L. I don't know. I wasn't only really listening, you know. But she's, this is uh, Orion, the mighty hunt. Now, by this time, I'm like, wow, you know, tell me more. I mean, this girl is just, she is so intense and she's so passionate. And finally, I looked over at my wife and we were kind of sitting away from the crowd. I, tears in my eyes. I said, honey, so something's wrong. I said, this woman, she's more excited about these dumb stars than I am about the God who I'm called to preach about. Who made the stars? Something is wrong. And I went home that day, and I, I said, that's it. I'm never taking that pill ever again. I'm not going to do it, okay? And I, I just kicked it out. And it's, I just realized I couldn't fulfill my mission numb. And every time I had a solution to my suffering, I felt like I got my little crutch, right? Oh, I'm tough enough. I can do it. And the Lord just kind of kicks it out from underneath me. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just take this pill. And the Lord just kicks it out from underneath me. And every time I got a crutch, I felt the Lord just kicked it out from underneath me. It took me some bad places. Look at Job. Let's do a post-mortem of Job's thinking. What happened here? What happened between chapter 1 and chapter 2 to chapter 3? Why is he in good shape and there? And then he's, he's, he's off his rocker in chapter 3. Well, I'm going to tell you what. Time plus isolation plus dwelling on your problems equals wrong thinking. Now, I, chapter 2, Job's friends arrive. Now, I don't think they flew Delta, and I don't think they got an email, okay? His friends are far away. Somehow word got to them. Something bad happened to Job. They got amongst each other, and they said, hey, let's go meet together at a certain time. They traveled that way. They're important men. I have no doubt, idea if it was weeks, months, or years that Job's been dealing with this. It has been some time. We know his wife has emotionally abandoned him. He's had nothing to do but think about his troubles for a long time. And he starts to spiral. And spiral. I'm going to tell you, with molten, going Christians that make me really nervous are the ones that have a lot of time to sit and think. That's when the devil likes to whisper lies. By the way, did I mention he's a liar? He is a liar. He wants to isolate us. He wants to tell us that we're all alone. He wants to tell us nobody's ever gone through what you've gone through. Tell him he's a liar. That's not true. Don't isolate yourself in your problems. If you have a spouse, talk to your spouse. You've got a wonderful church family. You have a great pastor. Talk to them. We are not made to be isolated. That's why God requires us to at least be in the house of God once a week at least so we can connect with our Christians. That we all have a job to do to encourage one another, to pray for them. I mean, live streams are great. They are no substitute 
for being in the house of God. And what the enemy is trying to do is trying to separate from the flock. Satan, he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The lions always go for the ones separated from the flock. Don't isolate yourself. There is nothing new under the sun. I have been to the edge. If you want help, I'll walk with you. I've been there. Secondly, Job put his focus on his third circumstances. You know, if we're not careful, pain can blind us. It gets so close, we can't see anything beyond it. Last year, I had something that never happened before. I, 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 a family called me up. They didn't go to our church. They, 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 they knew about me because they went to a funeral. I preached. Well, they had their daughter had, had passed away. They said, Pastor, you do the funeral. I never pass up an opportunity to share the gospel. I said, absolutely, I will. I met with a family. I said, well, she's young. What happened? And they get tears going down their eyes. They said, she took her own life. I had never done a funeral like that in my life. I called up most of my pastor friends. Have you done this before? What do I do? Do I talk about it? Do I not talk about it? We, we'd never done it like that either before either. I went to the funeral home. I said, funeral home. I said, obviously, you guys have seen this. What works? And the funeral director took his head and goes, you know, she just couldn't see past her pain. She was young. It would have passed. She lost hope. Christians, it's very important what our focus is on, and it's not our circumstances. The Bible tells us, you want to talk about running? When running gets hard, when it gets difficult, when we got the weights on us, and we're really struggling, what does uh, Hebrews chapter 12 tell us? Looking onto Jesus. You need to keep running. Is it getting hard? Look to Jesus. Focus on the finish line. Look to Jesus. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Connect yourself with a good friend. They'll say, you know what, buddy? I, I know you're struggling right now, but I'm going to come alongside you, and I'm going to focus you on Jesus. We're going to pray together. We're going to get where we need to get. I think thirdly, also, with Job, another problem is he fell down the rabbit hole of asking the wrong questions. He asked all these why questions. Why? Why? Why do I have to exist since I suffer? That's what it all boils down to. And, and we get stuck in this why loop. I'm going to tell you something. It's pointless when our minds go there. And many times as a pastor, they, pastor, why? Why did my, why, why did my family end up in divorce? Why, why did this terrible thing, why? I, I feel no pressure to have all the answers. I don't. I say, listen, the world's a, a sin, chaotic world. We may never know the answer. No answer is going to bring back Job's family. No answer is going to clear up his boils. I mean, this attitude solves no problem. It's a waste of energy. We just spiral in, just spiral in depression. And in fact, can I tell you this? God doesn't know us any, owe us any answers. Where does it say God owes us answers? Does Job ever figure out why he was suffering? Does, does God ever sit down with Job and say, Hey, Job, I want to tell you, uh, Satan, we, I talked to him one day and he called you out. And I, I challenged him. We never get that. He never gets that. And I'm not sure if we found out the answer to our why questions, if it would even help us out at all anyways. We had we VBS uh, a couple years ago. We we're getting all decorated for it. And so we're running around the church getting ready for VBS. And all of a sudden, I, I hear this loud scream and crash from one of the back hallways. And it come to find out, it was my wife. She fell down the step. Not the steps, okay? She Just the last one, okay? She went down. It was one of those things where you think you're at the bottom and you're not. And it's like, whoa, you know? And I mean, she landed just right. And, and I was, I've seen this woman give birth. She's a tough bird, okay? And I, the way she was screaming, I was like, uh-oh, this is bad. So I run over there like an action hero, pick her up. And, well, that's how I remember it, you know, carrying her to the car. And uh, she says, I got to go to the hospital. I said, our insurance is cheaper at the urgent care. I want to go to the hospital. Okay, we're going to the hospital. And uh, we went there. They took an x-ray. And they came out. And they said, ah, here it is. Here's the source of your pain your cuboid broke. I knew that scream was a cuboid scream. If I ever heard it anywhere, I knew it was. So I said, hey, look, honey, here's an x-ray. This is why it hurts. It's your cuboid. And she goes, okay. She got up and walked out, right? Just because we know why doesn't take away the pain. Christians, God has given us something so much better than answers. He has given us promises. And many times if he answered our whys, then we would say, I am a parent of two five-year-olds or two six-year-olds. Why? Well, it's because that's what we do. Why? Because I want to. Why? Why? And we'd be the same way. We wouldn't understand. He gives us these, these wonderful promises. Don't waste too much time asking why. Let me, i got to wrap up. I'm running out of time here real quickly. But let me tell you something. If I, if I was there, if I could talk to Job, maybe what would help? What would help? What would I do different? I'm going to tell you, maybe to tell Job, maybe the best thing to tell him would be absolutely nothing at all. 
there is comfort in presence. And I, I really think that Job's friends provided more comfort in those seven days of silence they ever did talking. If you don't know what to say, just don't say anything. A lot of people have good intentions, and they add to the suffering. I don't want to be alongside a casket of a loved one, mourning them, and have somebody put their arm around me and say, hey, don't cry. I can cry if I want to, man. I've told my church, I said, when I, when I, if I go, you all better be crying. I want everybody to be crying. Hey, if you're not crying, you don't miss me. I miss me already, you know? I mean, good night. Don't tell me how I should feel. Ultimately, if I said anything, I'd say, you know what, Job? Your God is greater than this. Any problem, any suffering, any pain, your God is greater. His grace is sufficient. If I had a little bit more time, I don't have that much time, but I would take it to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I mean, it's kind of the, Paul kind of has the same, like a similar little tiny Job experience where he says, hey, the messenger of Satan came to buffet me. Now, I'm assuming it's just like what we learned in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Satan got his wrinkly old self up there and said, Hey, God, may I have permission to get at one of your people? Now, boy, what a big, bad, tough devil he is. He needs to ask permission. He wants you to think he's in charge, but has he ever told you he is a liar? God gives strength to survive another day, and he gives it in the form of his grace, where, where Paul says, man, I got this weakness, and, but he says, but my grace is sufficient. God's grace plus my weakness is perfect power. God's grace plus my weakness is perfect power. What does that mean? Is that like a magical spell? Is it something? Man, I'm going to tell you what, you got to live that one. God's strength makes our weaknesses so strong through faith. He's not going to take away the suffering sometimes. He's going to do something a lot better. He's going to get you through it. 2009 was 12 years ago. I wish I could tell you that something changed. I wish I could tell you I had like an ear transplant. I'd love to tell you that worked out and I could have perfect hearing again. That's not true. I still had the loud ringing, which, you know, after that, the kids were born. If you, if you, if you roll over and sleep on your good side, you can't hear a baby crying at night. It's pretty, I mean, it's trying to roll, you know, trying to do something good here. I wish I could tell you I found some magical prayer or, or Bible study or a self-help book that said, this helped me take care of all my problems and I'm a perfect whole person again. I wish I could tell you that. In fact, sometimes I have bad days. They get fewer as I get older. But I have bad days sometimes. And it, Does that make me weak? You better believe it. I'm weak and so are you. Don't let that old devil lie to you. But I'm going to tell you something. God's great grace is made perfect. His strength is made perfect in your weakness and my weakness. We've got to turn it over to him. We've got to give it to him. I have found his grace to be sufficient. I didn't kill myself that day. I didn't. I had a godly wife. I had a powerful Savior. I had a wonderful church. And I got grace not just to survive. Grace to go, okay, I think I can get through this day. God has not given me that much grace. God has given me this much grace. I'm not surviving. I'm thriving. I didn't kill myself. I'm preaching the gospel of truth every Sunday, every Wednesday. And it is a wonderful thing. The answer to suffering is not death. It's turning to Jesus to find grace and strength. I'm going to tell you what. This is going to sound weird to you, okay? I might never get invited back ever again after this, but I'm going to tell you something. This is the honest to God truth, okay? If I could go back to 2009, somehow, some way, if I could stand at the edge of that, that airplane again, and knowing what I know now, would I still jump out of it? I had to think about it for a while. I think I would. Because it put me on the path of realizing that no crutch is compared to my Savior. There's no crutch, nothing I can ever do that compares to the power of my Savior. If that is the only way I can learn that, then Lord, take my hearing and my vision too. You see, I mentioned the main theme of Job is not that why do the righteous suffer? We get that answer early on, okay? The main theme of Job is let God be God. He is not for us to question. He is God and I am not. Things might not always seem fair to me. Trust Him. Trust him. That's a relationship I want with my children. I want them, I was telling the illustration, uh, we're going up north in a couple of days, and I can tell you what, my boys are not worried about what hotel we're staying at, how much it costs, where we're going to eat, how we're going to get back, how we're going to pay for gas. They don't, they don't, they're just excited in the future, but they go, dad has under control and dad loves them. Well, my friends, I don't know what the future holds for you, but I do know this. Dad knows he loves you and you can trust him. Come to Jesus, find him sufficient. Listen, you're suffering this evening. There's no greater message I can preach to you than tell you that greater is he than your suffering. 
Look past your pain to Jesus. Don't fall for those lies. That devil is a liar. In fact, let me just leave you with one little bit. Maybe, maybe you're feeling pretty good right now, and you're like, well, I'm, the message is not really for me. I'm not really going through anything. Life is hunky-dory. There's a little indication in the end of Job chapter 3. It's a little, little, something he shows me. And my psychologist brain starts going, Job's got some wrong thinking before all this happened. It, look at it, verse 25 and 26. He says, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest uh, when I was quiet, yet trouble came. What Job is saying is, you know what? Things were going well. Before all this happened, he goes, I knew it was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. I knew something bad was going to happen. I knew it. And i got to tell you, uh, I'll be really quick here. But when I had that experience walking out of the doctor's office, I realized I'm never going to go through that experience ever again. So I made up my mind that I, every situation I'm presented with, I will come up with the worst possible scenario, and I will accept it as true, and I will live every day thinking the worst case scenario. Therefore, I will never be surprised ever again. That's what Job's talking about. Can I tell you what? That is dangerous. That is a symptom your thinking is flawed. You're just one crisis away from destruction. I encourage you, come to Jesus. Trust him today. Find his grace. I promise you it'll be sufficient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share this message today. Lord, I've tried to be as transparent as I possibly can. Lord, I'm just a vessel. Lord, I want to be able to leave this auditorium with the thoughts and the hearts that are here is how great of a God we have. That, Lord, your perfect strength is available to be applied to our weaknesses through faith. That, Lord, if there's anyone here that's struggling and maybe they came out of a struggle and they're getting ready to go into a struggle, I don't know. If there's pain because that's life. That's life in a fallen world. It's going to come. Lord, may you just work in that heart and that mind today to bring them to you. They don't have to think about doom and gloom. They don't have to worry about the future. Lord, they can find something so much greater than just relief. They can find grace. Lord, if there be one here today online or in person who's never trusted you as their Savior, Lord, I worry about that soul. I pray for that soul. Let them come to you when times come, Lord. Let them see that, Lord, you might not get, you might not get rid of that storm, but you'll get them through it. Lord, thank you for being my God. Thank you for sustaining my life. Thank you for giving me purpose. Lord, be with this time of invitation. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.